Hi, I thought I'd do an update on where I am with the Vodafone Gigafast internet connection. For those of you that didn't watch the earlier video, I have subscribed to Vodafone's Gigafast connection using City Fibre's infrastructure, and basically what I'm supposed to be paying for is 900 megabits per second download and 900 megabits per second upload. And if you look at this speed test result, which I've just run, I'm getting good download speed, always well over 900 megabits per second, but the upload speed is absolutely terrible. And this is on a pretty good day. It seems to have got way worse since the earlier video. Now I'm lucky to get this kind of speed. Normally it's sub one megabits per second. So something seriously wrong with the network, but it's now over two months in and no one seems to be able to find out what the actual problem is. Um, I've had multiple engineer visits. They've all confirmed the issue, but I don't know if it's some situation between the fact that City Fiber own the infrastructure but Vodafone are the ISP, um, that communication between the two seems to be causing some problems. And basically, um, I'm kind of stuck here with a non-working internet connection. The upload speed would be okay. Well, it would be acceptable if it was actually working. But actually, what I find is I've got heavy packet loss. And if I do an, a YouTube upload, for example, using this connection, uh, it will stop part way through because uh, of too many dropped packets. Now in terms of packet loss, I'm just using PS tools here and if I ping the BBC server, you can see it seems to stop every so often. This is quite a high speed ping test, so it's basically pinging every time it gets a response. But you can see every so often it just pauses and then we get a lost packet. And depending on the time of day, this can be significantly worse than what we're seeing here. Uh, but you can see we keep getting timeouts dropped packets and if we stop that you can see uh, you know on this example we're getting about two percent loss so I've now just plugged in the virgin internet connection to this PC we run exactly the same test and it just carries on going no problems whatsoever and you can leave it like this for ages and we just see zero packet loss it works exactly as expected now the interesting thing is if I ping the gateway that I'm connected to at the optical exchange, I still get the same packet loss, which says to me the problem is either with the gateway itself, with the network transceiver, which presents itself as an optical connection to go onto the network, or one of the splitters along the way. But I don't think it's one of the passive splitters. It doesn't quite meet with the problems that I'm having. So it seems quite obvious to me that they need to investigate something at the optical exchange, but they seem to be a little bit clueless at this point. And I did actually manage to get out of the contract. So basically they've got about a week to fix this now before I get disconnected. And unfortunately I don't get my uh, gigabit internet. Now they have changed some of the equipment at my end. Um, I've had the Wi-Fi um, hub swapped out about three times now. And yesterday they swapped out the optical network terminal, which is this object here. Um, the engineer left it behind. He said he may as well throw it in the bin, but I thought we'd have a look today to see what actually is inside this. I suspect there's not a huge amount um, just because of the amount of integration that we get in these ICs these days. But let's have a look and see what's inside. So there's just a couple of screws here and it looks like there's two on the bottom which will get us inside. And we're in. There's really not a huge amount in the device. We've got the gigabit ethernet connector then we've got the isolation transformer for each of the lines in here. We've got some memory and then we've got the main SOC. This is made by 5V Technologies and there's not a huge amount of information out there. They do have a web page, but this is the only pay part of the website that works. Um, it appears to be a dedicated GPON SOC. So we've got a DSP, we've got the management stuff, we've got the GPON interface, and then we've got the actual um, processor that does all of the stuff like the PPPoE connection and all that kind of stuff. So uh, basically it's a fully integrated solution to take the optical input and present itself as an ethernet output um, with the PPPoE connection. Now power comes in from a 12 volt external adapter. So we've got a DC to DC converter here for some of the electronics on the board. Uh, we've got another DC to DC converter just here. And then on the underside, we've got a linear voltage regulator a 1117, uh, presumably for one of the 1.8 volt rails or something like that on the SOC. We've got a bit of memory and then not a huge amount else. Uh, on the other side, we've got the actual optical transceiver. And we appear to have a five pin device that is doing something to do with that. We've got a little bit of support circuitry here, but I think what we'll try and do now is actually try and get inside the can 
and see what's in here. Here's a close up of the SOC. So it's a 5VT. 2511B, but again, I couldn't really find any information about this device. So under the can is what is presumably a laser diode and also some kind of photodiode inside here. That goes off to the little fiber that then connects to this little adapter where you can actually plug in the external fiber. And then the chip here is a Semtec 25L98 transceiver chip. So there's not a lot of information out there about this particular device. It's made by Semtech and it is mentioned in this guide here. So a PON combination IC, it's got all of the laser diode stuff and it looks like it also has the photodiode stuff. Now I didn't find a data sheet specifically for this device, but I did find one for the 25L95, which is a very similar device. So you can see it's a 2.5 gigabits per second laser driver as well as all the other stuff that you need in there to drive that little laser diode and photodiode. And if we look at the block diagram, you can see here, basically it has the laser driver here. So we've got the bias for it. And then we've got the differential input for the data that's going out and that drives the laser directly. And then we've got all of the analog electronics for the receive pass. So presumably the photodiode connects to the RX in and minus. It goes through a filter limiter uh, and then we actually get the differential output to go straight into that other SOC. Now the fibre itself on the connector is absolutely tiny. You might just be able to see that green dot right in the middle. That's me shining a little bit of light through the fibre, but you can see how fine that actually is. So here's the little optical module. So we've got the fibre permanently connected to it. And then inside this device is a little beam splitter at 45 degrees here. So some of the light goes straight through to the photodiode. That is at 1490 nanometers. And then we've got a laser, which has the photodiode connections and the bias connections. Uh, that is sending light back out at 1310 nanometers. Uh, this looks to be kind of a sealed module. I don't think I can get it apart, actually. It all looks to be welded together. And so, yeah, behind that rubber boot, you can see that that fiber is actually permanently adhered into this device, presumably because it's such fine geometry, they need to get that alignment spot on. So I think that's about all there is to this module. Everything is pretty much integrated into this device, the little laser diode driver, and then the SOC. So everything is really well integrated, not a huge amount on here. A quick reminder, big thank you to my video sponsor, JLC PCB. If you do want to order some low cost PCBs, don't forget to visit them. Also, I noticed recently when I was just looking on the SMT assembly service, they now have more options for the PCBs. So you can get your green, black, blue, red, and white solder mass PCBs assembled now. And the number of components has extended considerably, all the way up to 80,000 components are available, including some parts, through-hole parts, that would be hand-assembled. So uh, really quite useful there if you're thinking about getting some boards made. So we'll see if anything changes in the next week or so, but they're pretty much running out of time. I did just this moment get a phone call from Vodafone to ask if I could take some more screenshots and some speed tests just to prove that I've still got the problem after City Fibre had been and replaced the ONT and also the Vodafone router. Uh, obviously, the engineer that came still saw the problem, but his word is not enough, apparently. Um, the main problem, I think, is that I'm the only adopter on the cabinet that I'm connected to. So there is a fibre that comes into the cabinet down my road and on my side of the road, uh, that then goes to a splitter, an optical splitter, which could split it between 32 customers, but I'm the only person connected to it. So I guess with me being the only one with the problem, it's a little bit more difficult for them to diagnose. But I would have thought they'd be able to plug something into the cabinet and, you know, have another one of these and just pretend to be a customer and see if they get the same problem on another line. But that seems to be beyond them. I, I don't quite understand why they are not very good at the diagnostics. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Basically, they've got a week and then I get disconnected and I'll stick with Virgin and my 4G connection. Incidentally, the 4G connection is working quite nicely. I made a few changes. I updated the firmware. Someone mentioned updating the firmware for the modem. I didn't realise that when you update the firmware on the Microtik device, it updates the router OS stuff, but it doesn't update the modem firmware. So that was a couple of, of revisions out. And I also made a change to the time to live setting. Uh, apparently some mobile phone providers, if they don't see that it's coming from a mobile phone which has a TTL setting of 64, then they sometimes throttle the data. I don't think that's actually the case with 3 and Smarty, but I changed that 
and it seems to be getting a fairly steady 24 megabits per second down and 24 megabits per second upload so that's good enough for a failover and actually incidentally I did have a problem with Virgin there was an outage for about two hours and I didn't even notice that I was on the mobile connection so that just indicates that it's working quite nicely plugging into my PFSense router. So I hope you found the video interesting. If you've got any thoughts or comments or your own experiences, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.